He let himself fall, head already bowed, and studied his hands. He had very pretty hands, slender fingers, and soft, pale skin. Like a boy's, these hands. And he studied them as the train swayed, and the conductor called, and people around him coughed and wrinkled the newsprint that was young and fresh and came off the page, colored their fingers like black cheese, fingerprinted them with the coffee burning through their stomachs and politics burning up in their heads. And the car swooned as he recalled the days he split wood with his father and watched his father take the hammer back carefully because he had slipped a disc and had known pain that had him bedridden for a month recalled his father's unnaturally pale face that month, the hammer down on the iron wedge, sending it with the grain to the ground where it shook and lay. It had seemed the ground shook, his father like a god above it. He remembered very clearly now. His hands showed no signs of the days he inherited the iron and hammer and smooth wood of the handle between his fingers. They had once been rough and sinewy as the wood that lay at his feet, naked, separate from the shells of bark. But he didn't care. He liked his hands either way. He liked being wrapped in wool in the morning and riding the train with the working class. He liked the feel of Manila in his hands and the ink he couldn't rub off because it meant something hard and universal and brought beautiful thoughts to him. And the world was quiet and the dew sparkled in anticipation of petty mudslinging. The man beside him in the cradle of the thundering car fell gently back on his shoulder and this time he didn't shrug or push him off. He had forgotten the eyes he met that infused him with loneliness the night before. He was solitude. He was young. He was sharp. He believed he was watched.